rand stronger for longer uh, we've certainly seen some rand strength and pretty much the view generally amongst everybody south africans is that the rand is a one-way bet in other words it is going to weaken it is going to move weaker over time um and and you know always position yourself for that and over the long term that is indeed a correct statement I mean, iran does go weaker over the long term here's a chart going back to the the early 90s and and showing what that currency has done over you know the, the what uh, 30 years uh of of this chart but what it also shows quite very clearly is that we have periods of fairly significant rand strength. And it, it kind of is counterintuitive for us. We, we look out at this point in, in, you know, 15 months into a pandemic and not many vaccines happening and, you know, this court case and that and lack of this. And, and, and we kind of like, no, but uh, the country's falling apart. But there are key drivers that move the currency. And I'm going to point out what they are this evening so that we can then also keep an eye on them and see that when they start to weaken slash turn slash deteriorate, at that point, probably we will see RAND strength is then over and we're going to start moving back into a period of weakness. There's always the caveat here, fire a finance minister or something like that. And well, you know, crazy stuff can happen. Um, but under sort of normal circumstances, the currency largely ignores the economics, uh, the, sorry, the politicians uh, and focuses on those flows. So that period over 30 years uh, is gotten an annualized an absolute about 412 percent from 92 to the current uh, uh, 1423. Uh, and I got to say, I thought that number would be bigger when it was only 412 over 30 years. Don't get me wrong, it's not a great number, nothing to get excited about, but I'd expected a bigger one. I, I, if you'd said to me six, 800, even a thousand percent, a 10 bagger on the currency, I would have said, sure, uh, yeah, absolutely. Turns out only a four bagger. But within that, are those periods of strength? I remember that collapse in the currency uh, peaked in 21 December uh, 2001 at 13, I mean, 1367 or there's about. I remember in part because my wife and I were panicking. We were going out and buying computers and white appliances and everything because we kind of thought this is it, you know, next stop 20, 60, 100, 500, whatever the case may be. And then we had a strengthening of the currency that took it from 1361 to 575. 57% strengthening in the RAND over, it was about it, 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 December 2001 through to sort of late 2004, early 2005. So call it over a three year period, uh, we saw a 57% uh, strengthening in the currency. Now, we then saw the post uh, global financial crisis where the RAND absolutely collapsed. And, and the difference between the two is that first one there, you can see, kind of we were on that depreciation. You can see the small blip in 1998, the emerging market crisis. We've kind of been accelerating and then it really took off. Whereas when the emerging market crisis came, we'd been weakening. And then there was just that sudden spike, that massive spike up. Um, and then from the, the worst levels there down to the strength, to, to, to the best levels, that was about a three year period. But what you note is that the peak of that 2008-2009 crisis did not exceed the 2001 worst level. I know people who took money offshore, and in a sense of I'm buying imported white appliances and computers, kind of in a sense I did too. Um, but it was 13 years before we got back to that 1361 again. So we had a 57% strengthening, we had a 45% strengthening. Uh, the Nene firing, which, and again, the Nene firing in December of, of 2015, again, the RAND had been on a, on a fairly pronounced weakening period, and we'll see in a moment to the data as to why that was happening. And then NS firing absolutely shook it out. And then a 38% uh, retracement over about a two and a half year period. That low there, which was February 2018, about 11 Rand 50. Uh, that's when President Ramaphosa uh, was, in, was inaugurated. Zuma stepped down, Ramaphosa took over and announced his cabinet. So 38%. And then where we're we sitting right now from the collapse to you know, 19 bucks uh, during the pandemic of, of last year, still in it, but during the sell-off in March, of, March and Feb of last year, we were about 26% stronger. And we've been down in about the 1335s 
Uh, and then last week, there was all the panic on Wednesday, uh, around well, Wednesday, U.S. nighttime, around you know the Federal Reserve and they're moving interest rates early, a year earlier, 2023 instead of 2024. Um, and certainly the rand shot up. And a bunch of folks were like, ah, it's over. The rand's toast again. And I'm like, hang on a second. Not so fast here. The, the, the fundamentals that have driven it stronger. Now, firstly, there is just that natural sort of retrace. It's overshot. It needs to come back a bit. But there's core fundamentals that have been driving it that are still in play and will continue to drive it. So what are those three broad fundamentals that are driving a currency? The one that is really the long term and less in your sort of day by day, week by week is inflation. Classic scenario, the RAND should weaken by the inflation differential between us and the, and the US. And we should weaken against the dollar, against uh, that, that, that differential. And if you look at what that's been uh, over the long term, last 30 years, it's been about a 4.3% uh, difference in inflation. And that's been about the annualized weakness of our currency. Now, not a straight line. I get that. Um, and the inflation is very much over the longer term. But we've gone from having an average 4.3% difference between U.S. inflation since the 90s until now to currently, as we stand here today, that difference is 0.2. Now, we're in a weird space with inflation. The U.S. is sitting at 5%. We're sitting at 5.2%. Core inflation, U.S. is about 3.4, and, and we're actually at, at 3.2. So we're actually slightly ahead in core inflation. I don't expect this 0.2 level to last for long. But I do expect that the inflation differential of 4.3% that we've seen over the last 30 years is going to be markedly narrower, probably closer to one, maybe one and a half. And the reason is quite simple. You know, if, if let's all go all the way back to the 80s, when, when you know, post the 70s, Reagan comes into power in January of 1981, uh, Flocker gets made uh, Federal Reserve Chair, and U.S. inflation is running at, at, at mid-teens, around 15%. And at that point, our inflation is running you know, probably around 20, even into the 90s. When you've got those big numbers where one country's inflation is 10 and the other is 14, uh, that gap is 4%. But as a, as a percentage, if you take from the lower base, it's a 40% increase of one above the other. But if the U.S. is running at, say, 2% inflation, uh, that same 40% then running at 2% takes us to 2.8, you know, th maybe 3% uh, in, in an extreme. So as that as the inflation moves to lower single digit, then that difference between the two is going to narrow fairly markedly. And I've got to say, I, I, am, I have two beliefs on inflation at the moment. One, I think the current inflation we are seeing is transitory. I think it's driven by commodities, it's driven by food, it's driven by I mean, milk futures went limit up seven days in a row back earlier in the year, which is completely crazy. Lumber went to some, you know, $1,600, whereas normally it trades around four or 500. Uh, best performing commodity last year, orange juice. So we're seeing it in food. But of course, there's also base effect. Uh, a year ago, we had negative West Texas Intermediate. We had uh, 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 even Brent at, at incredibly low levels. So we've got that base effect which of, of a massively depressed inflation a year ago, and now we're seeing inflation come into it. I do think it's transitory. There are always risks. There's no certainty here. But I think the higher inflation is transitory. I think our inflation, US, Europe, the rest of the world, inflation is going to come back into the ranges. For us, that target zone is 3 to 6%. But we've been, the governor certainly talks around 4.5. There's inflation expectation. You listen to MPC meetings. He never talks about the range, 3 to 6. He says 4.5. And, and that's anchoring inflation expectations. And what anchoring is, is quite simple. When you sit down at a negotiating table for salary increases, whether it be a union or whether it be you and your boss, if the range is three to six, you're picking six and your boss is picking three. If the governor's talking four and a half, you're both at four and a half, which is pulling back your expectation, pushing the bosses up a bit, although he's probably going to say, ah, four and a half, we're going to go with three. But we've, we've, he, the governor's pulled those expectations down. And of course, the other point is no demand. There's just no demand. I mean, our, our economy is struggling. Uh, we're not yet reopening. In fact, you know, up here in Gauteng, we're in a third wave that makes the first two waves look like you know, an amateur production. Um, and hopefully the other eight provinces don't follow. But we've just, the demand has fundamentally disappeared. Employment is rocketing through the roof, etc. But so I don't think we're going to see that differential as low as 0.2. But I think it's probably going to settle around 1% to 2% 
which is markedly below the 4.3, which means over the longer term, I expect the RAND to lose value against the dollar at a slower rate. So that's the first to watch, although this is a very long-term scenario, so that's less about the next couple of years, which is what we're focusing on. What drives the RAND? Commodities. This is the single biggest driver of our currency. We are essentially a commodity country. And when we think commodities, we think gold, we think a bit of diamonds, we think PGMs, and that's all true. Uh, but we've got all the other commodities. We've got iron ore, which is currently at, what, north of $200. A couple of years ago, it was it was $40. Um, we, we've got the industrial metals. We've got uh, a, 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 a zinc. We've got copper. We've got all those industrials. Not much listed. So from an investor perspective, we're just unaware that they're really out there. Um, and there are some. Orion is, Minerals is, is looking at, at, at zinc and copper um, and, and a few other bits and pieces. But we're a humongous commodity-producing economy, and we export those commodities. When we export them, that's dollar, it's money flowing in, right? Because you sell them into, czar, it's an, in, into dollar, it's an export. You sell them in dollar, and you bring back czar. We are exporting commodity. So what do we see? This is, to my mind, the killer chart. This is from uh, Jan 2020. Most of these charts are from uh, South African Reserve Bank. Some haven't been updated because this, for example, comes from their quarterly bulletin, uh, which goes up to end of March. So the next one will be out in about a month, which will be to the end of June. But this is essentially our exports versus imports over the last decade. Uh, and you can see the little orange at the bottom there, which is, you know, net. So we spent the first part of the decade of, of the sort of 2010 through to around 2012, mostly positive. We then spent the period down to 2016, mostly negative. And then we were mostly positive uh, up until the, the, the pandemic of last year. But those numbers have never been massive spikes. But look what we've seen in the most recent data from uh, May, June of last year, where suddenly, so two things happened. Obviously, in the hard lockdown, exports collapsed, but so did imports because we weren't buying anything. I mean, we, we were locked at home. People were losing jobs, losing incomes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we weren't going shopping. We weren't buying anything anyway. So, yeah, exports collapsed, but so did the imports, and the, the imports are your blue line. The imports have started to pick up again. In fact, imports have kind of normalized more or less-ish. But look at those exports. Look what those exports have done. They have gone crazy. They are at you know wildly record levels, whereas previously our best exports were maybe 120 odd billion. Uh, suddenly we're clocking 160 plus billion. In other words, they're 30% more. And those exports are commodities. We're not suddenly manufacturing. We're not, yes, we export motor cars and other odds and ends, but you know, it, I mean, it's even soft commodities. It's citrus, it's, it's maize, white maize and, and, and yellow maize, um, where you know, not only are we having a bumper crop this year thanks to rainfall, but we've got bumper pricing. Now, usually in the soft commodity space, a bumper crop says quite simply, well, hey, bumper crop, so you, know, you go and plant more and the price quickly corrects, but we've got import uh, uh, pricing parity export pricing parity rather. So huge benefits there. So that is our commodity boom. And that is what has strengthened our currency in the last, I suppose, yeah, in the immediate post the collapse of the, of the, the pandemic collapse, there's just that reverting back to fair value. And I'll touch on fair value in a moment. But what we've seen is that moving beyond fair value and, and potentially extended on. And the problem, the trick with hard commodities, your precious, your industrial commodities, soft commodities, agri, it's easy, right? Next year, the farmer looks out and he sees, where's the best price? I'll plant that. I've got a couple of fellow fields. Let me go and plow those as well. But if you're a miner and you're a platinum miner and you want to produce more platinum, you don't just flip a switch. Maybe you've got some mines on care and maintenance. That could take six months to a year to get them going. Um, if you've got green fields, you're looking at five, six, eight years. If you've got you know, brownfield productions, maybe three or four years. It's that, it's that lag. So the demand is there. What's driving the demand? A couple of things. But most notably is infrastructure spend. One of the global responses has, to the pandemic has been infrastructure. And we're seeing it even in South Africa. The announcement by President Ramaphosa of two weeks ago where uh, companies can now do 100 megawatts of capacity. I mean, that in of itself is going to be a huge user of commodities, of copper, of iron ore, of aggregate, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and, and boost those, those, those producers. And the global response has been infrastructure. 
and it's stop start. You know, Biden, President Biden's talking, what is it, four trillion, I think, but over eight years, he hasn't quite got it through yet. But commodities are what is driving that export, and that quite simply is what drives our rand. So where are we, are we in, in, the, in the bigger picture? <clears throat> this is the IMF or commodity index going back to 2000. You can see that spike up to 2008. Remember the earlier chart I showed you, that one there, you can see that massive move there uh, from the 1361 to the 575 from 2001. And then it, 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 it wobbled a bit, et cetera. Uh, and then of course, do you remember our load shedding started and then the global financial crisis and et cetera, et cetera. But if we can see that there, the commodity index went from about 80 and it peaked at about 140 or there's about. You can do dollars, you can do real, I'm um, ignoring the SDRs, they're not significant to us. But it, it, it went from around 80 to, let's call it 150. So it almost doubled. This commodity run, which started in 2016, and then we had the run from 2000. And nine, we didn't get much benefit for that. Um, we did to a degree. Uh, certainly, we can see it in the, the chart there. We improved a fair bit. That was a 45% move. But look where we are sitting now. From 2016, which let's call that 100, we've moved to about 140. If we're using the, the – and that's looking at the real. If we do it in dollars, we've gone from about 120 to about 190 or there's about. In other words – Potentially, we're only halfway through the cycle, certainly that cycle for the first decade of the century. Now, that was called a super cycle, and, and you know, is it different this time? Yeah, maybe it is. Maybe it is. I mean, China was building like crazy. Remember all those ghost cities, which are now full of people, because the thing with infrastructure, you've got to build it before the people arrive. You've got to build it before it's needed. You can't wait for it to be needed and then build it. So China was 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 urbanizing their population. Uh, about four or five hundred million people were urbanized, and that was a humongous commodity boom driven predominantly by China. What we're seeing this time is China's still urbanizing. They've still got 350 million people that they want to urbanize over, over the next five years. Um, so certainly that driver is still there. But what we've also got now is the rest of the world coming in with infrastructure spend. And that is the big deal. So certainly I think we've got more upside space in the commodities. This is the Commodity Research Bureau Spot or Commodity Index. And again, this one doesn't go back as far. But we're still we're, we're ahead of the, the 2010 levels, whereas on this chart we are kind of at those 2010 levels. But what's more important with this one is, 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 the, is the rebase effect and that move from the lows at the end of 2016, which has only got us up again less than 50%. Whereas the run from 2008 post the collapse, which was skewed for a bunch of reasons, now that run was almost 100%. Now, Make no mistake, the wheels can fall off here. Yeah, China could suddenly, the demand could disappear. We could not see the infrastructure spend actually be materialized. And of course, more production will be coming on. And, you know, it's cyclical. We'll get to the point at some point in the next, I don't know, two, three, four, five years, where we've got far too much production um, and, and, and suddenly demand, supply is overwhelming demand. That is going to happen at some point in the future. Question is, how much higher can we go? I think. We can go higher. The, the bigger point, perhaps, though, is that commodity prices don't need to increase. They just need to stay where they are. If we keep platinum at around 1,200, if we keep uh, palladium at around 2,200, if we keep gold at around the 16 to 1,700, it's higher at the moment, but at that point, if we keep those, if those commodities stay at about those levels, then we have got that you know, exports every every month of around 100, 165 billion of exports. And let's be clear, our economy isn't strong enough to import the similar quantity to, to, to offset. So they don't need to continue moving higher. They can just stay where they are and we continue to benefit. And there is a bit of a double-edged sword here. If commodities carry on moving higher, the, the, the platinums, the palladiums, the industrials, the softs and everything else, the agris, if they continue moving higher, then that inflation suddenly becomes a lot more worrying. They become a lot more structural. But there's a point at which buyers of commodities kind of start to stand back and say, yo, hang on. Now, it depends where you are, right? If you're, if you're building uh, something and you need steel uh, and the iron ore price is higher, you're like, yeah, okay, look, I'm halfway through building this 
facility, whatever it is, I, I need that steel. I'm, I'm going to have to bite the bullet. You might try push it back. If you're building homes in the U.S. and the lumber price spikes, what do you do? Well, you pull back. You just build less homes because you're like, hang on a second. I'm simply not going to be prepared to pay that price. So if commodities carry on running, that's great. Iran would do even better. But there's a negative to it in that we start seeing more inflation coming in. And then inflation starts to become structural starts to become baked in. And how does that most happen? Let's say our inflation hits 10%, just as a random number. Inflation hits 10%. Suddenly everyone wants 10% salary increases. Actually, they want 12% because they want to be a little bit richer. And then next year when inflation falls to six, they're like, yeah, no, I don't want six. I want nine. I want 10. It's that expectation I spoke about earlier, which our governor has managed so well by talking about the 4.5% as distinct from the 3 to 6% range. So certainly there is a risk of commodities. I don't think we're going to necessarily see much of them go significantly higher. They seem to be in a, in a, in a, in a happy place right now. But, and that's fine. I mean, that, as I said, it still gives us that right-hand side of the chart, still gives us those absolutely giant numbers and leaves us in a situation where we're just having money flow into our economy. And it's really simple. If we're exporting more than we import, it means there's more money flowing in than out. And that's what your rand is. Your rand is kind of, under normal circumstances, a vote on your economy. In our case, it's a proxy for commodities. Another driver of the rand is foreign buyers. Now, these are foreign buyers of our equity and bonds. And what we can see, and I, this is only going back a couple of years. It goes back to 28, April 2018. So that's three years of data. What we can see is broadly negative. Now, <clears throat> Those numbers at time here last year, and let's ignore that massive spike because, of course, that was the pandemic. The numbers have been running at between, say, at around 20 billion a month. Next, say, it's been running at around 20 billion a month of net sellers. So, of course, if you're a foreigner and you're selling bonds in South Africa or you're selling shares on the JSC, you sell them, you wait for the three day clearance, you take the money home. That's money flowing out. Whereas if they're net buyers, you're bringing money into the country and that's money flowing in. So about 20 billion a month running there that's flowing out. Again, if we look at that chart, 20 billion, there's still a gap there. That gap there is currently running at 50 billion. So even with the foreign buying sitting at around a, a, a net seller of 20 billion a month, we still got 30 billion a month flowing in. And these are giant numbers. This is massive. And, and yeah, our, our currency is massively volatile and traded because, because of its liquidity. And, and liquidity is partly driven because of our, our, our commodities. So there's always a lot of, of trade happening. So when traders want to trade our currency, they jump onto it. If they want to trade a, 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 an emerging market, ours is one of the preferred because of its liquidity. You don't see the same level of liquidity in Turkey or Brazil uh, or, or Russia a bit, but even not so much. So the traders jump into our currency. And certainly in the third tiers, your Philippines and the like, there's just not sufficient uh, uh, liquidity happening. So we certainly, I'm assuming that we continue to see around 20 billion of, 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 of ultimately net sales of shares and bonds by foreigners. Although then I went in this morning, got the latest update data here, um, and they don't have it in such a pretty chart, but suddenly it did swing the other way. Now, we had a couple of months, but certainly April was a, a fairly big swing positive. Although, truthfully, if you go back you know, a, 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 a three months, we had that those, those other two fairly big spikes back there. I'm trying to think, January, February, March, uh, I'm trying to run my, my, my months there. But April has swung. This number is going to be fairly volatile, and the trend is for sales. Now, will that change? Could we get to a situation where foreigners are net buyers of our shares and bonds? Certainly. That's what happened in the, the post-2001. And, and the foreigners were anyhow buying our commodity companies and our construction companies. Remember, ran up to the World Cup. Uh, and the construction companies doing great margins. Now, we now know that they were doing it because of cookery and collusion and the like. But the point is, the margins were there um, and the commodity run. So at that point, we were seeing massive inflows into our markets. And that boosted our stock market. That was 2006. Our top 40 was up 42% in a single year. So if this does start to change, and certainly, you know, so not April, it's, it's 
if it does start to change, if we do start to see a change coming through um, and we start getting sort of big swings positive, we start doing 20 odd billion a month positive, well, then you add that 20 billion to there. And then instead of 50 billion, you're now sitting at a 70 billion number. In fact, instead of 30, because that 50, less the 20 we usually see flowing out is 30. But if instead of my network is struggling, I am turning off my webcam. Instead of money, you know, 30 billion, because uh, 20 is flowing out, you've got 20 throwing in, and so instead of 30, you've suddenly got 70. So if that starts to change, if we see it running the other way and foreigners become net purchasers of shares or bonds, this could strengthen the currency even further. Now, of course, we could also worsen. I've assumed it's around a 20 billion average per month. That number could swing and it could start hitting 30, 40. Heck, it could start hitting 50 billion. And then all that surplus we've got is gone. Although we've hit in the last four years, we've only hit 50 billion twice. Once was pandemic uh, and the other time was early 2018. I can't remember what was happening early 2018. It's been such a long time. So short answer is we've then got that flowing together. So if we put them all together, Current account balance, this is quarterly data going back to 2000. I couldn't get my dates on here, but this is essentially 21 years of data. A current account balance <clears throat> has been running negative pretty much. There was a little bit in the early part of the century where we were positive, and then pretty much it's gone negative. And suddenly, look at that. Suddenly we are at, from, from minus 200, we're suddenly at almost, in fact, we're north, we're almost plus 300. And, you know, and there's many of these, we, you know, we can look at trade balance and all of those. They all show the same picture. They all show the data. Now, this is only to end of March. As I said, a lot of the data is coming from Reserve Bank, uh, and a lot of their data is a quarterly release, so we don't have for June. Uh, we're going back to March, which is it's a little bit old, but the picture remains broadly the same. We had a balance, a, a, a trade, uh, what was it, our, our biggest surplus since, uh, what, uh, 12, 13, 14, 15 years. In other words, basically the, 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 the previous decade, in fact, two de decades ago, we're seeing the data supported. And, you know, when I pitched this, someone was saying to me, ah, oh, but, you know, people always say the rand was strengthened and they can, they can prove it, but when I asked them to, they can't. But here is the hard data that says to you, the rand is strengthening. This is happening. This is real. Now, how long does it last? That will tell. Uh, here's our current account uh, a balance again, going back only, what's that, some five years. But we have gone from pretty much minus 4% on average pretty much the whole way. We were starting to look good last year. Pandemic came, and then boom, here we are suddenly from minus 4 to plus 4. We've essentially flipped around. Same story here, minus 200 to plus 250. We have flipped the numbers completely. That is what is making our rand stronger. In a nutshell, that is why our currency is moving stronger and will probably continue to. Some folks will say, oh, it's the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar is, is weakening. Uh, yes, no, maybe. This is the U.S. dollar index, what most folks are referring to. And yes, we have seen a bit of strength uh, from the, the, the pandemic levels uh, there of about 98, it went down to about 90, which is, what's that, about 8.5%, 9% strengthening there. Certainly, we are seeing a bit of dollar weakness. But if anything else, this is probably a small part of, 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 of the broader equation. Uh, this is much more about our currency and our, sorry, our commodity exports and our boom in commodity prices. So what are the three components that we need to look at to keep an eye on to get a sense for how much longer can we expect rand strength? One, the strong driver is commodity prices. If commodity prices remain flat, our rand will continue to strengthen and inflation will work its way out of the system and we are off to the races. If commodity prices continue to actually move higher, then our rand will strengthen markedly and we will start to see inflation really rear its head and we'll start seeing interest rate increases and then things just start to get a whole lot more messy. The rand will be stronger, but your bond will cost you more and the market will be under pressure and so on. A modest driver of rand uh, weakness is inflation, that inflation differential I was talking about. And another modest driver of rand strength versus weakness in the current period 
of those foreign sales of purchase or purchases of equities and bonds. Uh, question coming, I used uh, the, the JC data is different. I use the SA Reserve Bank, the South African Reserve Bank data, and that's generally considered to be more reliable than the, the, the JSC, uh, simply because the JSC is not always 100% sure, whereas the Reserve Bank knows because they see the RANDs leave the country or come into the country. They're watching it move around. So they, to, to my mind, the Reserve Bank data is more reliable than the JSC data on uh, foreign sales and purchases. The foreign sales and purchases can be a big driver. It absolutely can. But it, that number needs to get bigger. If we're doing 50 billion a month just thanks to commodity prices, we need to see something significant happen there. And as I said, inflation really is a very much a long-term story. So we don't stress that too much. Um, uh, some seeing some questions coming through. It's cool. Send your questions. I, if, if they're time specific, I'll get to them. Well, I'll get to your question at the end uh, in terms of, of the best pricing in, in, in moving rands. I'll, I'll get to that in a bit. We'll have a look around in that, and then those start popping up again. So those are the three we need to watch. The key one is to watch commodity prices. If they're flat, we're cool. When commodity prices start to come down, and they will because commodities are cyclical. Absolutely, they will. Either demand starts to deteriorate or production increases, or both of those happen, and we will be in a commodity bust again at some point, probably in about five years, give or take five years. Uh, right now, we are in a commodity boom, and we're absolutely absolutely running it. So where to next? So the question is, what's our target? So fair value is about 1450. And fair value, and I'm not using the Big Mac hamburger thing because that says your fair value is about nine bucks. And that that's great. The Big Mac index is fun, but it's not in any way a, 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 a viable you know, qualitative uh, research tool. The fair value from the likes where McCurry talks about it often, a uh, bunch of other uh, uh, peeps I speak to talk around it. They've got their fair value about 14, 15. There's a bunch of different ways you can compute it. Mostly it's long-term projections on that inflation differential. Some of them have got fair value as low as 13, 80. Uh, and I've actually seen some fair values up at around 15. But 14, 50 is about the fair value. The point is, is like anything that trades, is fair value is you overshoot to the upside, you overshoot to the downside, you go in both directions, and fair value goes all over, you know, the, the price goes both sides of it. My target for the currency, I think commodity prices can probably stay where they are through to the end of next year. Certainly, I think the middle of next year. So we've got another one year of, of strength, I think, at a minimum, and perhaps as much as two years taking us into 2023. And that then takes us to, and I've got a wide target, I'll explain it in a moment. That then takes us to a 10 to 12 Rand 50 target zone. Now, we got 13.35 a couple of weeks ago. So we're almost, the 12.50 is very, very viable. And the 12.50, I think, is quite easy. And that we're going to pretty much hit as commodities stay at the prices they currently are. And we'll probably get there early next year. If commodity prices remain at these levels for longer, the rand will continue, and then perhaps the 10 bucks is on the table. Or if commodity prices continue to increase, the 10 bucks is on the table. My sense is those two are probably not going to happen. I think commodity prices will start to weaken probably in the next two years, and therefore I think probably we're going to get to around 11 rand 50, maybe 12 bucks. But certainly I think 12 50 is easy, 12 possible. If my head is on the block, I, 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 would I bet? A case of good wine on 10 rand to the dollar? Mm, maybe not. 11 rand 50 to the dollar? Sure. Absolutely. But I can't bet all of you because like if I lose, then I've got to go and buy a wine farm. So let's keep it real here. But certainly my target is I think we can see a stronger rand. And I think a rand starting 11 dot something is very, very likely during 2022. So now what? I mean, that, that then is the, 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 the big question in many senses. Certainly, it won't be in a straight line. So I need to get that back. It's not going to be in a straight line. We're not going to see this all happen. And in fact, it's perfectly great that last week happened because we saw that sudden panic and the spike out, and now we're already back at 14.23. So it's going to be volatile. Don't panic on the weakness that we saw last week. Don't watch the rant. Watch the commodity prices. If they are where they are, the rand will come back. So don't, as it weakens last week, suddenly like, oh, I've missed the bus and rush out and move money. Continue to take your money offshore. Stagger it. I've got a, a process where I take money every month. Uh, I use the, the Shift app. It's nice. It's simple. It's a decent rate. 
Um, and I, I taking money every month. When I see some opportunities where perhaps the rand has suddenly strengthened, I'll take a little bit more off that month. I used to do it annually, then I did it quarterly, but now technology makes it a whole lot easier, and I'm now able to do it on a monthly basis. So, yeah, continue doing it out. If you're doing a monthly purchase of an offshore ETF, in other words, a JC listed, like a, the Signia 500, S&P 500, or the new Corsairs Global, or the Ashburton 1200, or whatever it might be, the One Invest uh, 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 Tech ETF, just continue to do it. Yeah, the, 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 the rand will strengthen, but at some point it's going to weaken again. And over our lifetimes, it's going to be weaker over the rest of our lifetime. So don't rush, don't panic. The rand strength, interestingly, does take some shine off commodity prices. Of course, the dollar is nice, but the rand is stronger, so those mining companies get a little less czar coming in. It takes some of the shine off. But they're still making super profits. Sabanya so Stillwater, their first quarter South African EBITDA for their South African operations was just over 15 billion. That's more than they paid for those assets. One, one quarter, three months, they get the EBITDA back. Now, EBITDA is you know, earnings before interest taxation, depreciation, and amortization. So it's not a, a headline earnings number, but it is still, they're, they're making super profits. So if instead of 15 billion, it drops to 12, maybe 10 billion. Those are super profits. Those are absolutely super profits. And Sabanya Stillwater will be doing great. If they can do on their South African operations 40 billion EBITDA for the full year, that was 10 billion a quarter instead of 15. That's 40 billion. That's just for SA operations. What's their market cap? It's about 60 or 70, maybe 80 billion. But they own half the, the market cap in EBITDA just on South Africa. Remember, they've still got their North American, the still water uh, businesses as well. So, yes, it will take some shine. But don't stress, these folks are making super profits, and they're going to do super great from it. Your trade is, I mean, you carry on trading. Now, you, you obey the price, you obey the stops. What you shouldn't do is trade across the currency. And what I mean by that is some platforms let you have a, a, a Zara account. So you've got a Rand account, and then you can buy U.S assets. You could go and buy Apple or you could go and buy you know, something in dollars or something. The problem is, is that you're then basically crossing the currency and you're taking the hit, uh, the, the buying the asset, which means if the currency strengthens, you might make money in your Apple purchase, or maybe it was a short, whatever. You make money in the trade, but you lose money in the, on the currency. You know, when the currency is weakening, yeah, trading in ZAR and then crossing into dollar, aside from the costs, is actually quite a nice idea because you get the, the tailwind of it. At this moment, this isn't a tailwind. You're straight into that wind. You don't want to have it anyway. So make sure if you're trading US CFDs or commodities or something like that, you're doing it in a US dollar account. That is hugely important. Investors, you carry on carrying on. Uh, use this for taking your shores. Remember those farmers every time the round collapses and you think, oh, I missed out. Well, we kind of get some 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 FOMO on this side, but if we've got a couple of years, then we, we can manage it. We can take our time. We can you know, stagger our money in. I, you know, am I still taking? I took some cash the other day. I think I got thirteen fifty five. If I'm right about the eleven fifty, then my thirteen fifty five looks terrible. But in my lifetime, I'm going to see twenty, right? So. Yeah, I, I'm not a trader of the currency. I, I'm an investor in a sense. Um, one question I'm getting asked a lot is, should we return, if we've got money offshore, should we bring it back? In other words, you've got dollars sitting in New York, should we bring it back into South Africa and take it at 11? The problem is now you're trading. Now you're a trader. You're no longer just being an investor. So I, I don't like that idea at all. I mean, certainly you could make some bucks there, but, you know, unless it's large quantities, um, you know, what's it going to is RAND strength in another 10 or 15%, unless you're talking really big numbers, costs are going to kill you, timing's difficult, and it's trading as distinct from investing. So for me, uh, that's not an option. Money that goes off goes off. I don't stress that at all. So I think we're going to see that RAND strength for the next year or two. Um, as much as we all hate on our currency, the currency largely ignores politics. Yes, when a finance minister gets fired, then suddenly we all care. But broadly, we are, the, the RAND is ignoring the, the politics. You know, in, investors around the world don't care about the politics that they are seeing in a country. What they care about is their ability to make a risk-adjusted risk, risk return. And they will invest in any markets, no question. It's not going to be a straight line. It is going to be an opportunity to take more money offshore, to continue investing offshore. It does mean a question coming through, is this going to impact my uh, uh, Signia 500, uh, S&P 500 ETF on the JSC? Yeah. 
because what will happen is let's say the, uh, the, the S&P goes sideways, the RAND strengthens, the RAND S&P will go down. Let's say the S&P goes up 5%, the RAND strengthens 5%, your S&P 500 ETF goes sideways. But this is a year or two. Uh, another question coming, should we then perhaps be putting money uh, into local rather than offshore at this point in term? And, and what they mean by that, they're talking particularly ETF. So in other words, buying the top 40 ETF instead of the, the, uh, 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 the offshore US or global ETFs. And again, I'm not. I, I, you know, I have a, an invest, certainly in my investing life, I have a, a strategy, I have a plan, and I run it. I, I just keep going at you know, the short-term fluctuations, and short-term to me is anything less than five years. The short-term fluctuations, I ignore. I ignore the market collapsing in pandemics. I ignore the RAND strengthening. I just carry on carrying on, and I just continue what I'm doing. Watch commodity prices. Watch those foreigners buying and selling, and to a lesser degree, watch the inflation. But the key one is watch those commodity prices. That, more than anything, is going to tell us what's happening. Let's see bunches of questions coming through. Uh, John, you're asking your view on SA bond funds for the next year. So I think they're going to – I can't I, – look, I, I am amazed, to be honest, at the levels of which our bonds are at the moment anyway. Um, you know, Brazil went into junk, full junk status, what, three years ahead of us? And their bonds trade uh, 200 points cheaper than ours. And, and I scratch my head, that makes no sense. Um, in essence, our debt is mostly in ZAR, which means you know, like 90 plus percent of our debt is in ZAR. The risk is if you've got dollar debt, when the RAND collapses, your debt just becomes un unsustainable and you're toast. Um, but our debt is in ZAR, which means you don't default, you just print. Now, if we can't pay our debt, uh, we go to the printing press, we print more ZAR, we pay the debt. I know inflation. Brand weakness, all of that. But the risk of default on our government debt is practically zero, um, and yet you can earn some 9%. You put a hedge in place to protect you against currency movements, and you can net yourself 6% or so per year, and that is deeply, deeply attractive. So, John, the short answer is I'm constantly amazed that our bonds rates aren't going down. Remember, of course, rate down, uh, yield down, price up, um, which is therefore positive for for for. Uh, SA bond funds for the, the next period. Of course, with the lower interest rate environment, we've seen certainly if you're going the retail bond, which is my preferred, because remember, if you're buying a bond ETF, you're buying in the secondary market, and you can actually lose money in that space. You want to buy in the primary market, so you want to go to the government retail bonds. And we picked up some in April of last year, I think 11.5% locked in for, I can't remember how many years, three years, five years, I think five years. Um, but lower rates, obviously, negative at some point, I see the question coming, when do I think interest rates will start going up? South Africa, maybe next year. Uh, depends. Our economy is, is, is weak. Our inflation is transitory and still well within the 3 to 6% range. Well, as I say, the governor does talk around uh, uh, three, uh, four and a half percent. And interestingly, what we had been having at MPC meetings was a couple of votes for a cut and a couple of votes for flat and the flat one. In the last MPC, we saw some votes for flat and some votes for increase. So it's kind of the sentiment is shifting. Globally, I don't expect rates in the U.S. until second half of 2023, maybe late next year, but I really don't see that at all. Um, yes, considering the long-term expectations for the rand to the dollar, what should investors aim for in terms of local versus foreign exposure? So that's a... <clears throat> Always a difficult question. Typically, as South Africans, we have far too much local exposure. You know, and, and, and this is true. Everyone has home bias. It's the same for Australian investors. It's the same for German investors. It's the same for American investors. Far too much local. And what I mean by that is that we just we don't have enough offshore. And you've got to look at your portfolio in its entirety. So include your, if you've got a pension, a retirement annuity, something like that. You need to include that as well. Because, of course, that's got Reg 28 involved at the same time. Um, what you've also got to look at is property that you own in South Africa, your primary residence and the like. In an ideal world, your South African exposure should, frankly, be single percentages. We're never going to – because our economy is, you know, a few percent of – the, the fractions of a percent of the global economy. But the bigger picture is we need assets in the – currency that we are earning and ultimately going to be spending it. So I think that's, that split should probably be somewhere around 40, 60, 50, 50 uh, in terms of local versus offshore. Uh, question coming through. Uh, okay, yeah. It's, uh, 
Some people, yeah, I, I, I think I, I'm understanding if I'm not bringing the question back and I'll re-answer re it. Yeah, the, the, the whole excitement when there was the thought that we could be 100% offshore with our retirement annuities. You don't want a retirement annuity 100% offshore because what happens when, or your living annuity, if you've got a living annuity and it's 100% offshore, that's lacquer, except right now, if I'm right and Iran continues strengthening, you've got another two years of decreasing income. And you've got an eye cut, cut yeah, you've got you've got to pull back. It's it's critically important. It's the point I made earlier. You need to have assets and cash in the currency in which you live. If you live in spend and czar, you need the next three to five years of 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 of, of cash requirements in czar. Now, if you're not retired, if you're still working and earning, no problem. But if you are retired, you need to have that balance. Uh, Sydney, with net zero emission targets, don't you think commodities would risk coal and sasol especially? Oh, yes. No, Sydney, you are 100% right. But that is a longer-term playout. <clears throat> coal, ultimately, is dead. There will be, <clears throat> excuse me, a time, I don't know, 50 years, 100 years, where you know, future generations are going to look back at us and say, you burnt coal and oil? What were you thinking? Were you off your head? Um, but right now, that is how we power this planet. It is coal and oil. It is moving. It will move fast, but we are still there for a time. You know, those, are, those are issues which are 5, 10 plus years out. I mean, Sassel, absolutely. I mean, you know, sassel has got a huge problem. ESCOM has got a huge problem in terms of their pollution. Um, PGM is considered the green energy. Uh, obviously, lithium and battery tech and the like, exciting space there. A lot of these commodities are not clean, but that is much more a longer term. Uh, another one from Sydney, won't the exchange rate dependence disappear with the disruption caused by cryptocurrencies? No, because cryptocurrencies aren't a currency. Cryptocurrencies are an asset for trading, but they're not a currency. And there's a simple reason why cryptocurrencies aren't a currency. Let's say that, uh, what was it, a month or so ago at $60,000 in Bitcoin, you bought something and now it's crashed to $30,000. Uh, you think you're a star. The person who sold it basically got half their money. So if you trade in crypto, crypto, you've got to immediately convert back into your base currency. Uh, Bitcoin and all of those, they are not a currency. At, at best, we can call them a commodity of, of, of sort. But they're a speculative asset. Um, and I don't think they're ever going to become a currency. They're far too volatile. Uh, Marit, please clarify. You're saying that one should uh, purchase ETS from their USD account. I, I'm not sure I'm understanding your question. If not, send it back to me. I'm saying if you if that you're going to see some pressure if you're buying uh, uh, ETFs, uh, offshore ETFs and Zar, you're going to see some pain over the next year or two. But if your retirement is plus five years, plus ten years, no stress whatsoever. Um, should you be buying some ETFs in a USD account? Absolutely. I mean, take that money offshore and, and do something with it. You know, buy some ETFs or, or uh, some folks are buying property, whatever the case may be. Some folks are buying crypto. Um, but it's just I'm talking more about your Offshore locally listed ETFs are going to see some pain, but don't stress it. You need to have those ETFs. You need them in ZAR because you're going to want to spend that ZAR one day. Uh, Daphne, we moved to the UK permanently in 2017, retired. Still a lot of movable assets in SA. Uh, what suggestions for moving them to the UK? Um, so I'm not sure, Daphne, if these are assets which are, are, are needing to be uh, uh, what we call mark-to-market, in other words, given a, a, a valuation to them, um, in which case the, the exchange rate matters, and that valuation might have uh, tax and cost implications. Um, but certainly, if we're seeing strengthening in the dollar, we'll start seeing strengthening in the, in the pound, we'll see it in the euro. Less uh, probably in those two because they're not commodity currencies. Commodities are all dollar-based. Um, but I would speak. I, I would say uh, uh, start looking to move. I mean, I, I would start to get into the mart. Uh, well, sorry, your question was at the top, and then it disappeared before the others, and now it reappeared. Um, your first question, Will, was what provides the best pricing in, or who provides the best pricing in moving rands to US dollars? And that's a great question. And honestly, I am not sure. Go and have a look. And now I can't remember. His website. Uh, I can't remember his website. Someone is actually so. It's, there's just so many moving parts, and folks are always changing. I use the Shift app because it's really, really easy. It used to only be for Standard Bank clients. Now it's for anybody. It's simple. It's easy, and the costs aren't onerous. And I'm old enough to remember, you know, three percent spreads and two percent moving fees and and the like. Um, well, drop me a mail, Simon. 
at just one uh, there, uh, Simon at just one lap dot com or drop me a, 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 a tweet or something. I will find the the, the website which has the uh, details on. So he's done a review because also it depends. Are you moving a thousand dollars, ten thousand, a hundred thousand, a million? And there are bunches of different ways. Uh, cool. So drop me that. Um, Investor Challenge. Serena, you are a star. Go to investorchallenge.co.za uh, and you will find it there. Uh, and then, well, oddly enough, I managed to delete your other question before I got to it. So Investor Challenge, he's got dig around on there. You'll find his article where he has gone into details. It's Patrick McKay. Uh, and I couldn't even remember Patrick's name, which is awkward because he used to be my neighbor. Investor Challenge website, and he's got the details there for the different amounts on how you can move them. And he looks at all the various different ones, including easy equities, etc. What you do want is you want the money properly in dollars. You can find the sort of pseudo accounts where they give you dollar exposure. Someone's asking about the uh, ETNs, exchange traded notes from ABSA. Yeah, I mean, they're a great product. If, but again, a little more of a trade, but you can buy, so the code is NEWUSD. It basically tracks the Rand dollar exchange rate. So today it would have been trading at 14.23. If the Rand goes to 11.50, it would be trading at 11.50. Um, at this point, I wouldn't be buying it. But once the Rand starts to be getting to around 10, uh, 12 bucks, uh, 11 bucks, I will start picking up some of that ETF from my trading account. Or it's an ETN actually. It can't go into a tax-free account. And the beauty of that is that then when the Rand does weaken, you can profit on it. Of course. It's a trade, it's subject to tax, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Brian, could we get a copy of the presentation? I was held up, only able to attend late. Brian, yes, the, the video and the, uh, and the PDF will be on justonelap.com uh, later this evening, let's say by 8 o'clock this evening. So you'll be able to get both the video of this and the PDF will be available as well. So that is absolutely available. Uh, and I'm seeing no more questions coming through. We were a little early on time, but rather a little early than late. Uh, and it seems that I lost my audio again, but that's fine. It was been straight through. I oh, know. I don't know why it's, it's asking me weird questions. Uh, not to worry about that. Ladies and gents, we will park that there. Appreciate your time. As I said, back again, 21 July. Uh, well, always a pleasure. Uh, Simpira, absolutely. Back again, 21 July, we're going to be talking savings. Uh, look after yourself, folks, if you can. Look after somebody else as well. It is, uh, as they say in the classics, crazy out there. Cheers, all.